Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Today I'd like to look at the parable of the talents, uh, which you find in the Gospel of Matthew. I was recently watching a video by Bishop Barron about this, which was rather interesting. I'll link it in the description. Um, it took an interesting and somewhat unusual tack, and I, there, it got me thinking about you know some of the ways that this parable is not commonly looked at. So I wanted to just take a look at it and share just a, a few other thoughts about it. So I'm going to start off, uh, I'm using, by the way, the New Jerusalem Bible. Um, it, it's, I like to go to this one because it's got very um, plain English language. Um, it, it accords very well in translation with everything else. It's it's a Catholic Bible with an imprimatur, Nihil Obstat, and so on. Um, so I just, I happen to like, it, it's, it's not the prettiest rendering into English, but I do, however, like the, um, it, it's very simple and direct and easy to understand in English. So, okay, so I'm, I'm going to sort of read it and give commentary. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of presupposing that everyone already knows the parable of the talents. Um, this is obviously, you know, interest primarily to Christians, and we've all heard it many times. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, um, the context for this is uh, chapter 25 actually begins, then the kingdom of heaven will be like this, and then goes on to tell the story of the wedding attendants um, with, with the, uh, the lamps and the oil and so on. So this is discussing what the kingdom of heaven will be like. It is like a man about to go abroad who summoned his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to a third one, uh, to a third one, each in proportion to his ability. Okay, now, right away, it's very, there, there are a bunch of very interesting things here, uh, when you know where it's going. Um, the fact that they were each given these talents, now a talent was a, a measure of weight, um, very often of silver or gold, some, something precious, and it was a fairly large, heavy measure of weight. Um, it's, it's a, as I presume everyone knows, a coincidence that the English word talent refers to an ability to do something. Um, it's just sort of a coincidence. Um, it's why occasionally you'll see translations that will call it like a heavy measure or something like that. Large sum of money. I've seen various translations do that to get around that, that odd coincidence in English. But anyhow, um... So if you don't take it to mean... Now, there are tons and tons and tons of homilies that have been preached. Bishop Aaron himself, himself uh, in the video I saw, mentioned that he's preached a lot of homilies about using your talents for God in, in the English sense. Um, but if we don't go along with that verbal coincidence, what does the talent mean here? And I think there's an interesting way of looking at this, where because um, we saw it, uh, where it said, um, in proportion, each in proportion to his ability... So another way of looking at those talents is some amount of work to be done. Not necessarily in the sense of talent, um, like the, the English sense of you've got a special ability to play the guitar, to draw pictures. Those are the things we refer to really as talents. But rather, um, a capacity for doing good. Which we would not call a talent in the ordinary sense in English, but it is nonetheless an ability. And so each each person has some ability to do work. Now, um, if you look at what do they do with the talents? Okay, then he set out on his journey. The man who had received five talents promptly went and traded with them and made five more. The man who had received two made two more in the same way. And then we're going to talk about the man who only received one. But if you look, each one took the, the measure he had been given and then went and used it. Now, the thing is, if you think about it, trading with five talents worth of value, you know, let's just for this say call it silver, even though it doesn't say that, trading with five large measures of silver is more work than trading with two. And moreover, I, you know, I think in the modern world we tend to think of things like investing in stocks, but they didn't go and invest in stocks, they traded. That is to say, they used this in order to buy goods which they then sold at a higher value, but you can only do that by doing work. That's not something where, especially in the ancient world, there were commodities markets where you would just call up, you know, a broker on the phone, you know, send, you know, buy carrier pigeon or a long string with a cup at the end of it in the ancient world. There's none of that, obviously. You didn't do any of that. You had to go and do the work yourself. You couldn't just 
you know, delegated to others by, you know, a single, you know, single word. So there's a lot of work that they, these servants are doing that is implied by this. And the more money the one was given, the more work he's got to go do. He has to go and, you know, the one who has five talents has to go and do more than twice as much work as the one who is given two talents. You know, two measures of, you know, we're saying silver here. So, if you look at this in terms of the amount of work they are capable of doing, you know, through endurance, through through um, willpower, and just the, the various things that enable them to do work, the one is more able to do work than is the other. Now, let's proceed. But the man who had received one went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, a long time afterwards, the master of... Oh, oh, you'll notice the one did no work. He did no work of any kind. He dug a hole, put it in, and that was it. Now, a long time afterwards, the master of those servants came back and went through his accounts with them. The man who had received five talents came forward, bringing five more. Sir, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. Here are five more that I have made. Now, he dug, in a long time, through a lot of work, the, it is the ordinary course of, of events, how you work at trading, he doubled his master's money. So that means he put in as much work using that money as was originally um, involved in getting it. You know, carrying of goods and you know, figuring, figuring out what's necessary, the carrying of goods, the moving them around, the storing them, the reselling them, and so on. His master said to him, Well done, good and trusty, trustworthy servant. You have shown you are trustworthy in small things. I will trust you with greater. Come and join in your master's happiness. So uh, there's also th that phrase, you have shown yourself trustworthy in small things, and you'll be shown trustworthy with greater. Um, is itself interesting, but more to the point is the come and join in your master's happiness. That the servant is, um, is then incorporated into his master and into the, the good which is done. Uh, next, the man with the two talents came forward. Sir, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. Here are two more that I have made. Now again, we see both of them doubled their money. So they both did the same proportion, but the one had a greater ability to do work than the other, so he was given more work to do. But the one who was given less work to do still worked as much as he could and doubled the money. And then, you know, the same sort of answer. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You have shown you are trustworthy in small things. I will trust you with greater. Come and join in your master's happiness. Last came forward the man who had the single talent. Sir, said he, I had heard you were a hard man, reaping where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered. So I was afraid, and I went off and hid your talent in the ground. Here it is. It was yours. You have it back. But his master answered him, Actually, b before I continue, now here we see that the man did no work of any kind. He didn't have that much capability for doing work. He was only given the one talent, half as much as the one with two, and one fifth as much work as the one who was given five talents. You know, measures of silver. And yet he didn't do one measure of silver's worth of work. He did no work. He just buried it in the ground, and that was the sum total of it. So we see here, interestingly, that even though he had the least work to do, he did no work. Even that small amount of work that he was given, he simply didn't even try. Okay. But his man... Um, it's also very interesting, you know, especially because we're talking about what's the kingdom of heaven like. Here it is, it was yours, have it back. That is, he did nothing with what he was given. He was given this work to do, he did no work, and then he's simply saying, whatever good you had given me, have it back, that he's having no part in it. He's not giving it back, he's simply saying, I don't want it. He's actually rejecting it. Because you can see here that he had buried it, he was afraid of the man, he buried it so that nothing would happen to it. And then just gave it back because he wanted to be rid of it out of fear. And so not only did he do no work, but he wanted no part in the master in um, he wanted no part in the master's happiness. Now uh, the master replied, 
But his master answered him, You wicked and lazy servant, so you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered. Well then, you should have deposited my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have got my money back with interest. So here, he's being the master is saying, even if you were lazy, you should have done more than just bury it. Especially, and here's the interesting thing, because the master doesn't say that the servant is correct about him. The master simply sort of gives it as for the, takes it for the sake of argument. If it was, if you actually believed that I am a hard man who reaps what I didn't sow and gathers what I haven't scattered, uh, you know, um, scattering seed, um, you know, which then grows. <sighs> Then you should have acted in a manner according with being afraid of me, as you said. Which would have been putting his master's, you know, putting this money in with the bankers, who then would have given him interest on his master's return. But he clearly wasn't afraid of his master. This is, I, I think, an interesting point here. When you look at this, the master is pointing out that he did not act in accord with his words. Had he been afraid he'd have at least done something that would have been absolutely certain. Because when you put the money on deposit with the bankers, you know you're going to get it back with interest. They, they take care of doing this. You don't get much money from doing this. You certainly wouldn't double your master's money as, in the same way that the, uh, the other servants who did a lot of hard work of trading had doubled their master's money. But on the other hand, it would have been just as secure as burying it and at least it would have gotten the interest back. So it would have been secure, probably frankly more secure, than just burying it because someone else could have dug it up. And he would have had some amount of pleasing his master involved. He didn't want anything to do with his master. He wasn't scared of his master. He just wanted nothing whatever to do with him. And he's now making an excuse that he was scared. So I, I think, I, I rarely hear that talked about, but I think it's rather significant that when he convicts the man, um, in Luke's version, you know, I convict you with your own words, but he, he's simply pointing out, you're lying. This is simply a lie. Had you actually meant this, you'd have done something different. But you didn't. So, the, the man clearly wants nothing to do with the master. Okay. So now, take the talent from him and give it to the man who has ten talents. Now, you also see something very interesting here, because the servant who was given five, and who made five more, gave it to the master, but he's re being referred to as the one who has ten talents. And we see here a hint of what is, uh, is meant by come and share in my happiness. That the man is, you know, that that servant, though he gives the, the you know, what he has made back to his master, is still in charge of it. And so, even though he has given it away, he still has it. Which, it, there's something interesting Bishop Barron uh, talks about interpreting this in, in light of the mercy of God. That the thing about the mercy of God is it, it's worthless if you hoard it, but it is worth, um, but, but all its value comes from giving it away. That in giving it away is how you actually have it, and that kind of curious paradox. And you do really see this right here, where even though that servant with ten ta that, that had made five more talents, had earned five more talents, had given it to the master, he still has it in this telling. For to everyone who has will be given more, and he will have more than enough. Okay, so, so to take that in halves, and, and this part's relatively straightforward, that the servant who has will be given more, that is to say, the, the, um, the, the servant who is actually working, who is using what he has been given, will get even more. That, that to take on the work of God is, you know, to give is in fact to get. I mean, it, it really, um, you know, within creation, creation could have been purely individual. Each person created having no interaction with each other whatsoever and only loving God. And our primary purpose is to love God. But creation is interdependent. Creation is relational. And so we not only get to enjoy God, but we get to actually participate in God by God's love flowing through us to the rest of creation. I like to 
say it's one of the themes of creation is delegation, that we, we get to actually participate in the loving action of God by being God's love to each other. And you can see that right here, that to one who has more will be given, in that the degree to which you give away what you've been given is participating in that divine gift. Because as, as St. John said in the epistle, God is love. Well, that another way of saying that is God is gift, which is also just another way of saying that all is grace. Um, no, not, not quite exactly the same, but they're very closely related. And so you can see here that, that sort of phenomenon that it is in giving that we receive because it is the giving that is actually the making of the gift we have been given real. In giving to a fellow creature, that is how we are actually accepting the ability to give to our fellow creature. And that is how we are being, in loving, we are accepting the gift of the power to love. And by being given the power to love, we are taking part in God, for God is love. Love and, you know... Um, the sense of charity, agape, you know, willing the good of the other as other. Uh, willing not in the sense of wishing, but in the sense of, you know, will, action. Okay. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have more than enough. But anyone who has not will be deprived even of what he has. And so the, the flip side of that is he who will not participate will have absolutely nothing. That you don't have... That, that the man who's given the, the one talent of silver... Even that proves useless because he won't take any part in it. He doesn't want any part in his master's business, and so he can't have any part in his master's business. That by rejecting any sort of work, by rejecting any sort of gift to another, he is failing to accept what is being given to him. Because, of course, God can... You know, th th there are, in a sense, logical limits to what we can be given. We can only be given... God can only give us what is good not what is evil. And so the only thing on offer is goodness, but that's love. And love only works as gift. And so we can't, we, we cannot not, we can't do nothing and be receiving that gift of the power to love because the doing nothing is the rejection of that power to love. As for this good-for-nothing servant, throw him into the darkness outside, where there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. And so, I think, you know, I mean, that, that being fairly straightforward, that he who will not take part, won't take part. Um, I mean, you know, it sounds a little tautologist when I put it that way, but he wanted nothing to do with his master, and so his master is giving him that wish of having nothing to do with him. He's being cast out to where he has nothing whatever to do with him the master. Um, so again, you see very much that theme. Now, there's the interesting question of why was it the one who was given the least? And I don't think there's anything within this parable that says that it was necessarily the one who was given the least. That is to say, the parable could also work, I think, insofar as everything we've seen, it could also work with one of the others being... Um, being given this, and you can see this actually if you compare with this version in Luke, because in Luke everyone's given the same amount, and then just one of the servants, um, you know, buries the buries his uh, measure uh, of money as opposed to the other. So, you know, just comparing the two of them, and one of them they aren't given given differing amounts. So, what is the function of it? Um, so, so uh, I don't think we can draw any conclusions that it must necessarily have been the one who had the least ability who was given the, the least talent, you know, the, the, the smallest measure of money in the beginning. Um, I, I don't think it's possible to draw conclusions about that being necessary. I think, however, it is, um, it does serve to illustrate that it is possible to draw the conclusion about the possibility, since it's, you know, happened. And therefore, it is even somebody who has been given the lightest burden, the least load. The man who was given one talent had the least work to do because he had one talent with which to do it. All he had to earn was one more talent. He had to do one talent's worth of work, basically, to keep up with the others. But he didn't. He didn't do nearly that much. And so even somebody given very little work can still shirk it. That, that it's... I think here there's the lesson to be drawn that shirking your work has nothing to do 
with how much work you've been given, but rather how much work you are willing to do. Because God will only give to you as much work as you're capable of doing. So shirking it has nothing whatever to do with, oh, I was just given too much work. Because here we see the story where the guy given the least amount to do was the one who shirked it, and the ones given more were the ones who didn't. They're all given according to their ability. And so I, I think that's, you know, why is it the one who had the least, um, or who was given the least who did this? I think it is useful to bear in mind or at least one function of this, because, you know, one should never ever reduce scripture to one meaning. It's, it's absurd to think there is exactly one meaning to this. Every meaning you can possibly get out of scripture is not something that is a, every true meaning you can get out of scripture has to have been intended by God, just obviously. It's impossible for God to be surprised by a meaning, a true meaning that is in scripture. And so you just sort of have to conclude that all true meanings that can be derived, legitimately derived from scripture were meant. They're in there. So it's the height of arrogance to try to claim that there's only one meaning, but one meaning that can be drawn is that we should never think about the burdens we have to bear in terms of, oh, this is too much. If I'd only been given less, then I could do it, simply because that's not how God works. He doesn't give us more than we can handle. Uh, there's the asterisk, he may give us more than we can handle in the manner we would like to. Um, we don't always know what work it is that God has to do. And Something I, I like to point out, um, mostly for my own sake, but you know, in case it does anyone else any good either. For all we know, the work God has given us to do is to bear frustration patiently as an example to others, to encourage others to bear their frustrations prior to them accomplishing something. It's possible that the work I've been given, for example, is to simply never accomplish anything that I'm intending and to be patient throughout it all such that, you know, my friends who see this take heart in seeing me be patient through all this and then they are able to get past whatever stumbling block they have patiently in order to do work and I've never got something, you know, that I would, you know, recognize visibly to accomplish. My entire job was just to always be a patient exam an example of patience to others. And so it's possible that never ever succeeding is in fact the tools I need in order to do my proper work. So, um, you know, there, there is that, you know, that one must bear in mind that, you know, we don't always know what our work is. The one thing we do know is that we've been given an amount of work that we're capable of doing. Um, so you can see that clearly in here in, in that relationship. Um, I think this is especially an important thing to remember for modern Americans because we always love underdogs. Um, and I don't know exactly how much, you know, every culture has that to at least some degree. Um, it's really very pronounced in America. We love underdogs. So, you know, here's the underdog and he doesn't come out on top. And I think that kind of grates on the American psyche a little bit. And so I think it's, in, in, you know, especially helpful for an American uh, like myself to remember that, that, that it has that function, that it does teach that, that um, it is possible to screw up no matter how little work you've been given to do. And so to, to bear in mind that, you know, your screw ups are not due to being given too much work, but rather to, you know, not just doing the work you have been given, and especially, you know, bearing in mind that you're not doing that work alone. God's there with you. So, all right, uh, just some thoughts on this that, um, another way of looking at it that I don't typically see, but, you know, seems to me to be there. Uh, nothing in this is, of course, saying any other true way of looking at this is wrong. Just another way of looking at it because every, as I said, every way of, every true conclusion that you can legitimately reach from scripture is in there. Um, so noting one doesn't take away from another. And uh, so it's just another way in case, you know, this proves helpful. Until next time, may you hit everything you aim at.